So I study Kung Fu and Tai Chi in my spare time, and some years back I had to change schools. And it was a culture shock. The teacher was a retired Marine. He re ran a concealed carry and gun use school when martial arts wasn't in session. We never talked politics, but it was a very conservative, in the sense of father knows best, kind of environment. The teacher required obedience and attention from the children in the class and shamed them publicly for infractions if they slipped. I might have quit, except that I noted that the children seemed fond of him in spite of his disciplinary style. I found him personally engaging, and finding a school that was open to women students, much less elderly ones, had been a chore. I actually enjoyed the ethnically diverse group of families that attended the school, and I noted the respect and care that Sifu gave every single one of them. Life is complicated sometimes, isn't it? Sifu David waged an impressive campaign with every new child who came into the school to get them in the habit of saying yes sir and yes ma'am when speaking to him and to the senior students. At least that's what I thought the rule was. Children should say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. About three months in, I overheard him remarking to an even newer adult student that he understood that at some schools the use of, the use of sir and man was not required, but it was here, and would he please get into the habit? Something that he had never said to me. And that was the first time it had crossed my mind that I was supposed to have taken a cue here and in this culture that an adult was expected to address another adult in this particularly formal way. I was embarrassed to have been so ignorant. But you know, that's the way it is with culture. We're so embedded in ours that we're kind of tone deaf to others. If we don't even realize that we're embedded in a culture, we are even more tone deaf. My teacher was aware from the moment I introduced myself as the minister from the church down the street that I was coming into his school from a very different culture, and I had been aware that he was treating that somewhat gingerly. And I was too, but I missed a big part of it, that outward show of title and respect that is important in most conservative cultures. He knew more about my culture than I knew about his, and I was humbled and I adjusted my behavior. Respectful address to teachers and adults and elders and so on is one small but only one part of a culture. Our culture also tells us who is to be respected and why, how dignity is protected, whose voice is heard most clearly, who is in and who is out, how conflict is managed, what language is acceptable, how time is understood and dealt with, what counts as disgusting and wonderful, and what an acceptable breakfast is, among many other things. The culture war that began in the 80s between conservatives and liberals was mostly played out in the realm of sex and gender. Women's rights, women's roles, abortion, then gay rights, then transgender recognition and inclusion have all seen significant progress, really, at dizzying, dizzying speeds in cultural context. The culture war went well for liberals, though it's not won and it's not over. But what I want to talk to about today is another set of aspects about culture, which have been in the press lately. The part of culture that tells us how we respect each other and how conflict is handled. The set of norms that are, we are so embedded in that we don't really even see them and may even be surprised to know that they have a name is called the dignity culture. In dignity culture, human dignity comes with humanity. This principle is enshrined in our nation's founding documents. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness endowed by our creator, not because we're good or in the upper class or educated or even as it was eventually seen white, but because we are human. It is baked into our constitution. Unitarian Universalism is a child of the same era and ethos. You find these words in our UU principles, the worth and dignity of every human being. 
This way of looking at human beings gives human beings a fundamental equality and dignity regardless of what they do. They can be a danger to society and have to be incarcerated, but ideally this punishment will fall short of violating their fundamental human dignity. I don't know how well we do there, but there is a reason that we don't, for instance, parade a heinous killer naked through the streets or behead the corpus corpses of mass murderers, stick their heads on pikes and let them rot, even when they have transgressed, even when they have violated the dignity of others, the sensibilities of our dignity culture forbid such actions, which were commonplace throughout our world in many places two centuries ago. In a dignity culture, you don't have to defend your dignity against slights and insults. If the offenses against you are large, you will apply to law enforcement, courts, and justices. If it is small, you're encouraged to just ignore it. To fight for one's dignity is to leave a whiff of uncertainty about it, after all. And the dignified thing to do is stick your chin in the air and walk away. At least that's what my mother always told me. <laughs> Sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Winston Churchill, also steeped in dignity culture, said, never fight with a pig. You'll just get muddy, and the pig enjoys it. <laughs> Very undignified. This is not the only way to manage the slings and arrows of being around other human beings, but it's our way. Another way is called the honor culture. Honor culture is a part of our pre-enlightenment European heritage. In an honor culture, the amount of honor a person has, the amount of respect they can command, is not inherent to their humanity. It's rather assigned by culture and must be maintained and defended by the person. This is not our culture, so let me belabor that point. Your honor is not inherent in an honor culture to you as a human being. How you are seen, how you are treated, not only by the people around you, but by society as a whole, your rights and opportunities can be lost by your own misdeeds, and they can be lost if you do not defend yourself from slight or insult by others. You have to jealously and carefully guard your honor and your friends and family will help you. Honor culture persisted into the 19th century in the dominant Western culture, and it persists to this day in some subcultures which do not have the privilege of law enforcement and court access, such as some isolated rural communities and underserved city areas. In this culture, honor is earned. Men earn honor by responding to insults, slights, and violations of their rights with self-help violence, brawling, and honor killings. Women earn honor by marrying a man of honor and keeping herself sexually pure. The most formal self-help violence, which was available only to upper-class men, was the dual Hamilton style. Women had recourse to the hard slap across the face if their honor was impugned by what we would now call an inappropriate remark. This gesture would hopefully attract the attention of honorable men nearby and hopefully provide safety for the endangered woman. The southern states had a fundamental conflict with the dignity culture, which mandates the equality of all human beings, and they hung on to the honor culture in some ways to this day. Dignity culture requires a working apparatus of justice and law enforcement to keep the peace and respond to major in assaults to a person's dignity, like the theft of their property. Much of the drama of Western movies and TV shows of the middle of the last century involved the culture learning to trust the lawman and not take justice into their own hands. Where law enforcement does not exist or can't be relied on, honor culture tends to take over. Gangs, to this day, tend to run on the honor culture, even in the middle of the dignity culture. There are other cultures besides honor and dignity cultures in other parts of the world, and also here, notably what's called the face culture of Eastern Asia, which is also the native culture of some Native American tribes. And now there's a theory afloat that the dignity culture is being challenged in this nation by something unfortunately called the victimhood culture. 
Now, if you suspect that this nomenclature comes from people who are describing and deploring the behavior of others, you're right. Those whose behavior and motives they are describing are too busy to spend much time naming themselves, but when they do, they tend to use the term the call-out culture. Oddly, the sociologist who coined the term victimhood culture about five years ago in an article called Microaggressions and the Rise of Victimhood Culture has maintained to this day that he does not understand why the people he is describing object to the term. I mention this so that you can Google victimhood culture if you want to pursue this topic, but I'm not going to use it because I see it as a denigration of other people and I understand exactly why those described object to it, as I'm sure you do too. About the same time, five years ago, Jonathan Haidt, a respected social critic, wrote about another aspect of this same social phenomenon in his book called The Coddling of the American Mind. He believed that the generation after the millennials was so coddled by parents and schools, frantic to assure their emotional and physical safety, that they became emotional weaklings. When they entered college a few years ago, they insisted on the same levels of safety that their parents and schools had afforded them, and they therefore have distorted academic institutions in unfortunate ways. Haight has some very interesting points to make in his book about overprotective child rearing, but he seems to me to be kind of clueless about life outside of his privileged world. So why does all this matter to us? Well, once you know the key words, you'll find this discussion going on all over. Yesterday's Washington Post had an op-ed piece by a sympathetic professor about what her supposedly coddled students really want, which is dignity, by the way. A couple of weeks back, an author describing herself as an Amer African-American feminist decried the call-out culture as toxic in the New York Times one of the responses that she got was, the call-out culture isn't toxic, you are. This sermon has been in the making for months. Since I came across manifestations of the call-out culture, which I found baffling and raw within my own beloved and comfy Unitarian Universalist Association. From the point of view of those who introduced me to this, the call-out culture is an important and effective tactic in our shared goal of dismantling white patriarchy and becoming a denomination that's truly welcoming to all human beings. And I do share that goal. And I was surprised at how desperately uncomfortable I was with the tactics until I learned about the dignity culture and discovered how embedded I am in its details. It also matters to us because a fracas broke out at GA last year when a minister took hate's ideas and applied them clumsily, not always accurately, and definitely hurtfully to people in the larger UUA and handed out his book freely uh, and widely at GA. He called it the Gadfly Papers. So this culture war, if that's what it is, is on us too. The call-out culture is not a full-blown culture complete with directions about appropriate breakfast foods. It is rather, I think, a new set of tactics to address the problems that cultural minorities face in a culture where straight white men hold the vast majority of power and privilege, whether they want to or not. These tactics, it seems to me, are measures to restore dignity to those who have not had, in practice, as much dignity as dignity culture would ideally have given them. Those who love the dignity culture, and I'm one of them, can be reassured this is a campaign to strengthen the dignity culture overall. And to understand it, we have to take a little detour into the world of microaggressions. Microaggressions are the slights and stares and minor insults, hurtful jokes, and possibly well-intentioned but actually tiresome and uncivil comments and actions perpetrated by people in the in-group on people who are in the out-group. Even if you are straight, white, successful men, you have been victims of microaggressions during your life. I am sure of it. Even if it was only from an upperclassman a long time ago or a workplace bully who fancied himself smarter than you. 
And because we've all experienced these little slights and sly put downs, we all know that it is simply not true that words can never hurt us. I totally get this as a woman. I'm no longer subject to whistles on the street, but I remember how they could pop your feeling good balloon by reminding you that there's a man over there who thinks that he has a right to your attention, to the street, and maybe even to your body. A child of the dignity culture, I was taught to stick my chin in the air and walk on by, and I did, but it still chipped this piece off my own self-esteem and good day. Not a very big deal in itself, but when followed by walking into a doctor's office and told to go with one of the girls into the examining room, somebody my own age, and leaving there to go to a meeting where a man makes a remark about women drivers, and when gently confronted about that, explains it away as just joking, as if that's any kind of excuse. Chip, 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 day after day. No one thing hurt me very much. That's the micro part. But the whole of it sometimes feels like death from a thousand pinpricks. And that's the aggressive part. It's one of the burdens of being a woman, being gay, being a person of color, being someone whose face or name evokes foreignness in white America. Microaggressions are one of the ways that consciously and deliberately, or unconsciously and just cluelessly, people in the in-group are confirmed in their status and people in the out-group are kept in their place. Call-out culture is a set of tactics that work better than the tools of dignity culture to deal with that barrage of pinpricks, which really can lead a person to bleed to death. There are four manifestations of the call-out culture, which have been very uncomfortable for the establishment, that's you and me, and those who've come in contact with them. The first is the call-out as a response to microaggression. Call-out culture says, if someone is offensive to you about your dignity, even in a small way, even if they say it was just a joke or didn't mean you any harm, just shout it out to the rafters. Shame them on Facebook and let all your Facebook friends pile on. This stuff hurts, and the hurts add up, and we are breaking, and nothing else has worked so far, so wham! I never did that. And I think that unless it's carefully done, it can backfire. And I'd cringe to see it, but I totally understand. The second aspect of this culture is to ask for safe places, where a person from a cultural minority can have some respite from the microaggressions and small indignities. They're an everyday part of their lives. The dignity culture has said that you should just let that kind of thing roll off your back. But some of the folks in the outgroups have said that they are dying of that thousand pinpricks, and they need places where they can count on not getting any more for a while. To call this request for safe space coddling seems to me to be astoundingly unimaginative. Another aspect of the call-out culture that's come under fire is the disinclination of students these days to put up with speakers on campuses who've been invited there by uh, other student groups to make the case that women, persons of color, immigrants, and so on are inferior beings who don't belong on campus. The outgroup students work with the university officials to try and forbid that speaker or threaten such dangerous and undignified ruckus that the authorities feel that they must cancel the speech on grounds of public safety or they disrupt the event while it's happening. This sort of behavior is seen as an offense against free speech and free speech is kind of a sacred cow in the dignity culture which refuses to understand how words can hurt you. Disputed speakers on college campuses are rarely official personages, such as candidates or presidents, or even academicians. Rather, they tend to be professional provocateurs. And I think that the students have a point in resisting their presence. A few years ago, Milo Yiannopoulos was invited to UNM. You might remember this. And the protests of women, immigrants, and students of color did not convince the administration that this man who specializes in inflammatory, disdainful commentary against feminists, immigrants, and Muslims 
was not an appropriate speaker in an academic institution. The administration, using the mores of the dignity culture, couldn't bring itself to disallow this speaker and even waived the security fees usually required of student groups that sponsor such events. He came, there were protests, he left, he later disgraced himself so much that now he's banned nearly everywhere. The protesting students were right. They weren't asking to be coddled. They didn't want their fundamental human dignity called into question by a university sanctioned speaker. I get that. Finally, the call out culture is demanding new kinds of official formats and processes to handle complaints of microaggressions. This too flies in the face of our dignity culture's assumption that if it's micro, you put your chin up and walk away. These new official entities are doing a new kind of work and they're bumbling around a bit. That's to be expected. Can this new format of handling interpersonal conflict be misused? It can. Can they do things which seem dumb and wasteful in hindsight? Absolutely. Do they need experience and guidelines? Yes. But if you take seriously the human experience of women, persons of color, and others who have not been in the in-group of the dignity culture and who, who have not been protected by the dignity culture and just want what was promised them, perhaps you will see the need for some new tactics. In my opinion, this new culture we are being told is threatening the dignity culture is not threatening it at all. I'd say it's not even a new culture. Rather, it's a new set of tactics to bring home to everyone the blessings of the dignity culture. It's uncomfortable, it's raw, it can and it will be misused because people are people, but I think we will all be better off when we understand that words really can hurt us. And maybe, just maybe, a few years from now, we will be a little farther along in realizing the purposes for, this, for which this church and this nation stand, a world where everyone has dignity and where justice and compassion prevail. <laughs>